Hello, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> okay. Before I get started, I got to tell you a little interesting story about uh, how many of you own a laser pointer. You do presentations at work. I was a couple of people, right? Well, I had one too. I I, I don't know what I did with it. I lost it somewhere. Anyway, so it was yesterday, and I couldn't find the laser pointer. So, and I wanted to use it on a not extensively, but on a few slides to point some things out. So, uh, where do you go? You want to buy a laser pointer? I went to Staples. What's a laser pointer? They said. Uh, this is Staples. Well, you have everything to do with, you know, presentations and boards and all that stuff. They didn't have it. So uh, I went to Best Buy. They didn't have it. I went to Barnes and Noble. No way. I went to Hobby Lobby. Never heard of it. Uh, finally, I ended up at Walmart, and I asked a person at Walmart to help me out. And I was standing there in the stationary area looking for a laser pointer. And she said, you know what, sir? Have you tried the cat toy aisle? So here's my laser pointer. Right from the cat toy aisle at Walmart. It works. All right, what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, a lesser known World War II uh, bomber aircraft. I always find the lesser known airplanes uh, that have unique capabilities or more interesting. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the B-26. It's a Martin aircraft. Uh, Martin uh, was a, a great player in World War II, many examples of combat aircraft, and even after World War II, uh, Martin uh, ran a, a good production line. Uh, later on, 1995, uh, Lockheed uh, bought Martin, and it became Lockheed Martin. And now all you see on the sign is Lockheed. So anyway, Martin's in there somewhere. Okay, the B-26... Uh, most of you probably know, was famous for, or if it's famous at all, it was primarily involved in the European theater in World War II under the 9th Air Force flying out of England. But early on in its development, uh, we actually had a group of B-26s flying in the Pacific out of Australia. And I'll go into that in a little more detail later, but the B-26 actually participated in the Battle of Midway in uh, June of 1942. After that, uh, logistics kind of dictates what happens. And if we're going to run a bomber pipeline, we're going to do it with one kind of spare parts, B-25s in the Pacific. If we're going to uh, field the B-26, its logistics pipeline is going to come out of the East Coast. We're going to operate it out of England. So that's how they separated that responsibility. But the B-26 has always been sort of upstaged by its cousin, the B-25. You know, first of all, they called the B-25 the Mitchell, named after Billy Mitchell. So that got a lot of popular support. Everybody wanted to know about the Mitchell bomber. And then there was uh, uh, the best event uh, during the outbreak of World War II. We uh, did a raid on Tokyo led by uh, Colonel Doolittle and flew uh, 12 B, uh, B-25s, and uh, that was uh, just brought joy to the country because nothing had happened after Pearl Harbor. We're just kind of floundering around, and that raised everyone's spirits. So the B-25 has always been more famous uh, than the B-26. And B-26 has had some bad press, and some of it deserved. Uh, it, uh, the B-26 was... Uh, the B, uh, I, I'm calling my presentation the maligned marauder because in many ways it was maligned. There's a lot of negative things about the B-26, and I want to try to uh, even out the argument about its, uh, its value and its effectiveness. But uh, B-26 uh, started out, uh, because it had so many training accidents, it quickly gained, uh, gained a reputation. It was called the Widowmaker. It was called the Flying Prostitute. Uh, because it didn't have any visible means of support. The wings were so short, uh, it was called a flying prostitute. Uh, or a play on that, the manufacturing plant was in Baltimore. It was sometimes called a Baltimore whore. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so it went on. Uh, it was accepted for production and all that, and I'll get into more details as I go forward. Uh, but uh, it had a very difficult time being introduced to the flying community. Young Brand new basic trainee pilots had a very difficult time flying the B-26 for some very interesting and unique reasons, which I'll go into in a few minutes. It has such a poor safety record 
that it actually endured two congressional investigations. In one of those, the airplane was grounded uh, and not allowed to fly again until they sorted this mess out. So, uh, on the other side, the combat veterans that are flying the B-26 out of England and those that flew it in the Pacific were raving about it. They thought it was a fantastic airplane and they were getting great results. In uh, one report, they intercepted some uh, chatter from the Japanese uh, uh, Naval Air Force and they were complaining that they could catch the B-25 after a bombing mission, but the B-26 was so much faster they had a diff difficult time catching it with a zero. So um, it is sort of an unsung hero of World War II and I'll, I'll try to give you some, uh, some facts about that. But uh, the combat veterans are, uh, of the B-26 uh, did a yeoman job in England, and uh, you might say uh, they're working in the shadow of the B-25, not getting credit. So the combat vets of the B-26s were sort of like Lady Godiva's horse. You know, they were doing all the heavy lifting, but nobody was looking at them. So, so we're going to ask ourselves the questions as we go, th as we go through this. Did we push too far too fast with this high-tech bomber? Did we force it into the hands of people who were not able to handle it or fly it? Did the urgency of national security and national survival in World War II, did it justify uh, the tremendous uh, losses we took in the B-26 in the, in the training uh, regime? Was that justified? Uh, I'll go through this and you can draw your own conclusions about that. I'm first going to talk about the history of uh, development. As I said, it is an entirely new uh, type of technology that was, delete, that was uh, uh, released into the combat forces of the United States. And then I'm going to talk about a comparison between the B-17, the B-25, and the B-26. And then we'll talk uh, more detail about the unusual flight characteristics of this rather unstable airplane and why it was such a problem. Uh, getting people to fly it and fly it well. And finally, we'll talk about the combat performance. What did it actually do? How successful was it once it got into the European theater? Now, in order to understand the B-26, you really have, the story begins in 1939. <clears throat> Does anybody know what this is? B-10, exactly, the Martin B-10. So, 1939, uh, we had exactly 133 B-10s. Does anybody know how many B-17s we had? 33. 33. But this is 1939. Japan was at war with China. The ME-109 had been flying and flying missions uh, in the Spanish Civil War since 1935. B, uh, 1939, a uh, few months into that year, the Japanese Zero was flying. And we had the B-10 with a maximum speed of 213 miles per hour. Matter of fact, if you look closely, that's an open cockpit. Want to smoke a cigarette while you're flying? You might as well. So it was a time of urgency. The War Department was really getting concerned because we didn't have a damn thing to fight a war with. We had almost nothing on a flight line. So uh, we needed to take some action, and we needed to do it quickly. In other words, there was a need for speed. We had to quickly acquire the airframes we would need to defend the United States, and those airframes we bought had to be quicker and more agile than the B-10 and some of the biplanes, biplanes we were flying in the 1930s. So because it was such an urgent time, the Army Air Corps issued a circular number 39-640 in March of 1939. Now, a uh, Army Air Corps circular is essentially, uh, in, in modern terms, it's an RFP. You all know what an RFP is. In other words, uh, the RFP said, uh, we need a twin-engine bomber. It's got to carry a 3,000-pound bomb load. It's got to go at least 300 miles per hour, and it has to have a 1,000-mile range. So the uh, several manufacturers responded and uh, went before the uh, Army Air Corps uh, Commission and tried to win approval for their design. 
Well, two designs prevailed. One was the B-25 and the other was the B-26. So uh, the Army Air Corps uh, told uh, North American, go ahead and uh, build a flying version of that. And they told Martin, build a flying version of that. And we'll see which one is the best. So those two were accepted. But the thing you got to remember is this, this is such a strange time. These approvals were done from a sketch on a piece of paper, just a sketch. And the engineering calculations based on some wind tunnel tests about how fast these airplanes would go and how much go and how much they would be able to carry based on nothing more than that. The, uh, the Air Corps said, <clears throat> yep, uh, go ahead and try to build them. We're going to pay for it. So off we go. Now, Martin <clears throat> had an interesting approach to the B-26. This was their design strategy. There was a uh, chief engineer, a uh, recent Annapolis grad, uh, who was working, uh, was the head engineer for Martin. His name was uh, Peyton Magruder. And Peyton had a really wild idea. The Air Corps wants a 300 mile an hour airplane. I'm going to make them a 400 mile an hour airplane. I can do it. I, my slide rule tells me I can do it. So his goal was 400 miles per hour. Now, this would have been really interesting because uh, the British Mosquito uh, would sometimes get up to about 400 miles an hour, but there was nothing else in the sky that could approach this, and uh, certainly uh, not the fighters of the day. This would have been a, a real coup if he'd been able to do it. The maximum speed of the B-17 was 300 miles per hour. So this would have been uh, quite, a, uh, quite a development. So here was his strategy. He uh, was an aeronautical engineer, and he wanted to build a very low drag, streamlined wing and fuselage. And because if, if it was low drag, he calculated that he could actually use a smaller engines, smaller engines and achieve that fantastic speed. He also <clears throat> uh, wanted to use state-of-the-art uh, engines and propellers. He had an eye on what he was going to use to power this airplane. And then he had some really wild ideas about advanced manufacturing technology that no one had tried before. So first, let's talk about uh, the wing, the wing of the B-26. What did uh, Martin and their engineer Magruder have in mind? OK, <clears throat> let's look at this first. This is the typical wing shape of the day. This is 1939. And uh, typically, you've got a uh, rapid rise here at the leading edge on the top camber. Well, first of all, uh, if you draw a line from the front to the back, right down the middle, that's the cord of the wing. And then above that line would be the upper camber. And below that line would be the lower camber. But this was typical, fairly flat, uh, lower surface. And following Bernoulli's principle, uh, you develop lift by making uh, the air that goes over the top move faster than the air on the bottom, and it moves upward, gives you lift. Now, what Martin found out, and several other uh, uh, scientists at the time, there was something called a laminar flow wing, laminar flow. The big difference is this. The laminar flow wing, note, does not rise quickly at the top leading edge. But its highest uh, point is back, right about back here, the transition point. So uh, if you're uh, flying a typical airplane uh, like this one here, you get turbulence. The air begins to separate right here and creates turbulence. What does turbulence do? It causes drag. It slows the airplane down. But if you build a laminar flow wing, uh, and have your peak uh, back here, you greatly diminish the turbulence uh, that's generated on the top of the wing, and it goes a hell of a lot faster. Now, there were uh, two other airplanes uh, in World War II that had laminar flow wings. Anybody know what they are? P-51 and B-24. This, uh, this is really a smart group. All right. So that was the, uh, that's the strategy on the wing. And I've got, uh, I ripped off a couple of uh, pictures here from uh, some old World War II propaganda films. This is the B-25. 
uh, as comparison, what do we got here? Here's the big early rise in the top of the wing, that really high camber. Down here is the B-26 wing. And actually this thing is, uh, the, that section of the airplane is stacked upside down in the factory. So, yeah. For example, this is, this, is the, this is the top edge of the wing. And over here, this is the top edge of the wing. But notice how slender this is. And notice how the top uh, camber rises and peaks much farther back on the wing than the typical uh, wing of the day. So the next thing uh, Magruder had in mind he was going to build, uh, he was going to get just the best engine in the world. He was going to use the same engine, that's uh, Wright Manufacturing Company, their uh, model 3350 with a turbo supercharger. This is the engine to sell of a B-17. Puts out about 1,700 horsepower per engine, and he had earmarked this for the B-26. But guess what happened? When he went a knocking on uh, Wright's door, they said, we'd love to sell you some engines, but everything we've got and everything we're, we've promised to build for the next three years is going to the B-17. You can't have our engine. So Magruder starts looking around for something else, and he finds that Pratt Whitney has just built this ginormous um, radial uh, engine, air-cooled engine, it's called the Pratt & Whitney R2800. <clears throat> the R2800 uh, went on to a number of other airplanes. Does anybody know what they are? P-47, the Hellcat, the, no, the Hellcat, the Corsair, P-47. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. So this became very popular, but this is 1939. This is one of the first uh, versions to come off the production line. This was the R2800-9. Uh, <clears throat> Do you know what the, the engine that went in the P47 later was the R2800-57, <clears throat> a much more refined engine. It had been through a number of uh, upgrades and refinements. So Magruder said, this is the only engine I can get. This is a lot bigger than the 3350. <clears throat> I'm going to design, I'm just going to change the design of the B-26. <clears throat> I'm going to have, I'm going to make much larger nacelles to accommodate this engine. Now, Magruder accepted that engine, and it's got more horsepower, but he wanted the, the real essence of this, he wanted the turbo supercharger. It was really going to make this uh, 2800 sing. This is a sketch from the P-47. <clears throat> the pilot would be sitting right about here. This is a huge piece of machinery in the P-47. It takes up a lot of space. <clears throat> so he wanted the 2800, but Pratt & Whitney told him, we haven't designed a turbo uh, supercharger uh, for the 2800. It doesn't exist. And Magruder's saying, hey, I got, a, I got about a year to go. I've got to produce an airplane. So he shopped around, he found a, a small single-stage uh, non-turbo supercharger and uh, stuffed that uh, uh, into uh, his design. But before I go on, uh, the original design with the B-17 engine, it was uh, a 414-mile-per-hour airplane. When he built the bigger nacelles, more drag, and used the 2800, if he had been able to get the turbo supercharger, it was going to be 392. That's pretty darn respectable. But what he went forward with is the R2800 with a single stage supercharger, and that dropped the airspeed down to about max airspeed about 326. Still above the criteria, the low the minimum criteria, which was 300 miles per hour. So <clears throat> he's got that going for him. He's got his engine. Uh, uh, sorted out. Now he's got some more aces up his sleeve. He's really going to make a fantastic airplane. So he uh, began to look for and plan on some advanced manufacturing technology. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, the first thing they looked at was uh, stretch forming, which I'll explain in more detail on the next slide. They actually used a, a heat treatment on the wing panels that uh, deserves a, a, a closer look. <clears throat> he so precisely was able to manufacture the skin sections on the fuselage that uh, they were actually using spot welding instead of rivets, which greatly streamlined uh, uh, the aircraft and uh, cut down on drag. They did some other innovative things. Because he was making such a thin wing, he added a layer of corrugated aluminum in overlays under the skin of the B-26 to make it more resilient and more resistant to uh, flak damage. The uh, wing section, the wing uh, box for this thing was the heaviest forged wing fuselage box to date, bigger than the B-17. The B-26 was the first to have an electric gun turret. And uh, here's a curiosity. The B-26, unlike many of the other airplanes we look at in World War II, <clears throat> uh, had an electrically driven prop. Now, the standard prop in those days was the Hamilton Standard Hydraulic. It was working great. It worked so great, the Japanese came over here in uh, 1935, and uh, they got permission from Hamilton Standard to use it on all the Japanese airplanes. <clears throat> that came back to haunt us. Uh, so anyway, he wanted this electric, electrically driven, driven prop. I'm not sure why. Maybe it was weight, maybe reliability. It's, it's unknown, but there it was, and it was quite advanced. Now we look at this in a little more detail. What is stretch forming? <clears throat> this is really interesting. Once again, this is 1939, not 2019. This is pretty sophisticated stuff. So stretch forming, uh, you put your aluminum sheet in an oven, and you get it up to about uh, 400 degrees. Then you roll the sheet out, and you uh, put it in these gripping jaws. And this stretch block, uh, they use different shapes on the stretch block that would exactly replicate the frame of the B-26. So when this, uh, when this, these pistons rose, they would actually stretch the aluminum fabric to the point of, of permanent defor deformation. It wouldn't spring back. It would just stay in that shape. The other thing they did is because the B-26 had a perfectly cylindrical fuselage, and that was tapered at the front and tapered at the back, what you could do in the stretch block, if you look at this in depth, you could have a different uh, diameter uh, on the back of the stretch block than the diameter of the bend up here. So it would actually fit perfectly into that, into that contoured uh, fuselage. This was a, a tremendous leap forward in aircraft manufacturing. This is, a, uh, <clears throat> this is Carolyn. <clears throat> this was the last flying uh, uh, B-26 ever. And you can see, uh, just I put this in here to illustrate how smooth and clean uh, the lines of the uh, B-26 because of stretch forming. Now, I mentioned that uh, he also uh, did something innovative uh, with the wing sections. This is uh, flak damage on a B-26. <clears throat> but in addition to the normal uh, stringers and uh, spars, this is the overlay of those the corrugated metal throughout the wing to give the, the, that thin wing more rigidity and less flex. He also did something uh, that he called uh, wing heat therapy. Wing heat therapy. <clears throat> they would uh, put the aluminum panels that were going to be riveted down uh, to the top of the B-26 wing, and they covered them with these very high-power electric blankets. And they had cut the wing panels to attach to the joists, but they cut them a couple of millimeters short. So when they put these heating blankets on, the aluminum skin expanded and reached out and uh, slipped over uh, the joist to which they're going to be riveted and they butted up against each other. And then they quickly removed these heating blankets, jumped in there with asbestos shoes and a fireman's hat, and uh, riveted the skin onto the top of the wing. <clears throat> so what happened? The, uh, when the aluminum cooled, it put tension on those wing joists, 
which greatly helped to stiffen the wing. Another extraordinary innovation. So what, uh, what finally went to the, uh, <clears throat> the fly-off competition <clears throat> was a very low drag fuselage and wing, thanks uh, to these innovations. Another thing he did by, uh, you see this curvature here, if you didn't have stretch forming, every time the diameter of the fuselage changed, you'd have to have another section of metal. But with stretch forming, you could use you could make larger uh, panel size that fit perfectly uh, and and could be spot welded. So you're eliminating all the typical seams that go into other aircraft, and it made it much more uh, efficient. If you look, uh, another thing uh, here is something interesting to consider <clears throat> about this guy being ahead of his time. If you take the props off this thing and make that a swept wing on either side and hang some jet engines on it, you've got today's modern airliner. Same fuselage. 1939. Now by uh, comparison, he has his cousin that was also approved at the same time, <clears throat> the B-25, uh, much smaller engines, but the B-25 had some drag problems. Uh, it was a fat wing, created a lot of drag when, it, when they tried to force this thing to go 300 miles an hour. When it, uh, passed, when it passed the test uh, for future production, the turret wasn't there. These blisters for the guns was not part of the airplane. Uh, the tail gunner's position was not there uh, because they wanted to demonstrate how fast it could go. So everything that was added uh, to the B-25 afterwards created drag that its power plant had a hard time dealing with. We also had twin tails back here. B-26 only has one tail. More drag. So after uh, this uh, flurry of activity, after about 18 months, the B-25 uh, flew first. Its flight test was 19 August 1940. And the War Department said, good enough, we'll start with 181. Uh, just a few months later in November 1940, the B-26 flew and they ordered 201 B-26s. And here's a remarkable fact. Uh, so the prototype flew in November 1940 and the first combat-ready B-26 was delivered to the Army uh, Air Corps three months later. There was no prototype. There was no testing. There was no rigorous examination of stall characteristics. <clears throat> they didn't know what the weak points on the airplane were. They didn't know what it could really do, how high it could fly, how much it could carry uh, in, a, in, a, in a heavy bomb load. They just said, we need them, we want them. Actually, before the ink was dry, uh, on this uh, approval, they ordered a thousand more. Now, uh, as I'll show in a slide a little bit later, uh, the, the ultimate numbers of, uh, for these two airplanes, B-25, they made 9,800 B-25s. They made about 5,300 B-26s for a reason I'll go into later. But they're off to the races. Now, let me just... Uh, as a, <clears throat> another point of comparison, look at the difference uh, in the wing shape and dimension. It's the same scale, B-25 on the bottom and B-26 on the top. Short, stubby wings, very thin wings, laminar flow. Now, here's a comparison of uh, uh, three of their, our leading uh, bomber aircraft, the B-17, the B-25, and the B-26. And what I want to point out here is look what uh, happens with a laminar flow wing. There's no free lunch. Do, do, you, do we have any student pilots in here, private pilots? Almost a pilot? Yes, great. Okay, we all, but the rest of us, we all know what stall speed is, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it has nothing to do with the engine stalling. Not like an automobile. It means that you've gotten, you've gotten too slow and your angle of attack is too high and all that air uh, on the top of the wing is, has gone to turbulent flow. And uh, what happens if you uh, take an airplane all the way through stall, the nose drops like a rock and it's going to take you 
depending on the airplane, 500, 1,000, 1,500. It took me 5,000 feet to recover from a stall on a T-38. I almost bailed out. But look at, look at these numbers. Uh, here, here's what we're teaching people to fly. We're talking about primary trainers now, like the T-6 Texan and some of the Cessna trainers. Uh, they're showing up uh, for B-26 uh, indoctrination, and uh, they're, they were flying airplanes that had a stall speed down in the 80, around 80 knots. Uh, the B-26 is 125. If you go below 125, you're going down. Look at this, uh, this comparison. Only 96 uh, miles per hour for the B-17 and 97 for the B-25. Uh, weights are a little different. B-26, uh, about a ton heavier uh, than the B-25. Minimum control speed. I want to talk about this in some detail. This is a real killer uh, for the B-26. <clears throat> Minimum control speed is different for every airplane. It's not related to stall speed. Minimum control speed is unique. It means that if you're taking off and you lose an engine, there is a airspeed you must achieve to have enough airflow over the rudder with your foot all the way down, rudder fully de deflected. You've got to reach that speed. And if you get to that speed, you will defeat the yaw created by the dead engine. And you can fly, you will be able to fly, a, a continue level flight, <clears throat> maybe get around and, and land the airplane. That minimum control speed uh, for B-17 losing an engine on takeoff, 106 miles an hour. B-25, 145, holy mackerel. If I lose an engine on takeoff in a B-26, if I'm below 170, I'm in big trouble. Let's look at max speed now. Uh, there's a number of max speeds. Uh, you've all read about these. There's rated speed, max continuous speed, uh, emergency war order speed. <clears throat> I'm going to melt the engine's speed. All those speeds vary uh, by aircraft, <clears throat> and they vary by uh, what version of the engine is uh, on the aircraft, when it was produced between 1940 and 1945. But generally, generally, the max speed of the uh, B-17, about 280, <clears throat> the B-25, about 275, and the B-26, 325. Once again, uh, laminar flow wing, extremely high landing speeds. This scared the bejesus out of uh, new pilots trying to learn to fly the B-25. In some cases, 135 was the fastest the trainer would go <clears throat> before they got to the B-26. Uh, costs are kind of interesting. Uh, the B-25 uh, coming in at 142 uh, average over the years. Now look at this, 181,000 for the B-26. Why? All those sophisticated manufacturing techniques takes a lot of time, takes a lot of uh, a lot of effort to put that airplane together in the manner that Magruder wanted it. Uh, so, uh, you know, for an additional uh, twenty thousand dollars, you could have had a B-17. And once again, the production numbers: twelve thousand uh, over twelve thousand for the B-17, uh, about nine eight hundred for the B-25, and actually five thousand two hundred sixty-six uh, B-26s. All right, so things are going fine. We've got these airplanes flying. We've ordered hundreds of them. Uh, we're going to get into this war effort. And uh, <clears throat> then we find out there's something wrong with the B B-26. And as I like to say uh, in the vernacular, uh, and then the wheels came off. I don't mean the wheels came off the airplane. The wheels came off the whole program. The spring of 1942, there was this tremendous uh, rapid expansion of uh, B-26 fleet and pilot training. At that point, the only training base for the B-26 was McDill Field near Tampa, Florida. <clears throat> so you've got this uh, literally chaos. Remember now, there's no computers. There's no Internet. Everything you do is with a pencil and a typewriter. And... Here, here's what happened in the uh, spring of 42. First of all, in 1939, we had a goal, the War Department had a goal to train 1,200 pilots a year. One year later, in June 1940, the War Department says, We've, we're going to fund and we're going to train 10 times that many. Our goal for 1940 is 12,000 pilots a year. 
And uh, that was in June 1940. In March 1941, they said, you know, we miscalculated. What we really need is 30,000 pilots a year. Now, when the war was over, uh, there was a tally, and they found out that they actually sent through pilot training and graduated into varied air various airplanes. <clears throat> they actually trained 250,000 pilots. So, if you're starting an airline in 1948, you get all the pilots you need. Okay, so it was chaos. Uh, they were inundated with uh, new trainees, uh, airplanes being delivered from the factory. Uh, they had too few experienced instructors. They didn't know what to do. They were, the students so outnumbered the instructors, uh, they didn't seem to be any solution. So they took uh, the first group of students through the, the program in the B-26, and uh, the top 10 out of 100 students, the top 10 who landed the airplane best and flew it best, they didn't go overseas. They grabbed them and said, you're staying here. You're now an instructor. That's where the instructors came from. They were merely more experienced students. So uh, this led to um, variations in instruction technique. It, it uh, allowed people to make their own interpretations about how to land the airplane, not the safest, but what was easiest. And there was no standardization. There was no control. The maintainers uh, had no idea what they were doing. These guys were working on the Martin B-10. Now they're working on the B-26 with an electric prop. Uh, and uh, this new engine and all these electrical systems they'd never seen before. Uh, very poor uh, support. The support was there, but the numbers didn't work. Factory reps from Martin came down, set up classrooms, but the tech manuals hadn't been, uh, hadn't been uh, published yet. And uh, the technical uh, bulletins that go out to update you on the best technique for repairing the whatever, none of that had been published. And when it was, guess what? It's going by snail mail going to get on a truck in Baltimore, and it's going to end up in Tampa someday. So uh, it was an extremely challenging uh, environment. Well, it's also true that that thin wing design that we've talked about here previously really complicated uh, the landing uh, technique for the airplane. And minimum control speed uh, that I just talked about, where if you lose an engine, you've got to be going that fast, or the rudder won't, won't keep you in the air. Uh, they didn't even talk about that. Maybe they knew about it. They didn't want to talk about it for a number of reasons. Uh, so th things got so bad that at one point uh, in 1942, they were the B-26 was having 165 crashes tr in training, 165 crashes per 100,000 hours flown. If you superimpose 100,000 hours flown onto the daily air traffic in the United States, that would be 75 airliners crashing every day. Now, uh, back, back to the maintainers. Why were they having such a, such a tough time? Well, th things are always in flux. This was a, a madhouse, the beginning years of World War II, a logistical madhouse. Somebody had the great idea that uh, they could stretch uh, the fuel at the refineries. They could make more fuel, refined product, eligible for Avgas, which is between 100 and 120 uh, octane, if you added something called aromatics. Uh, benzene and toluene uh, in, into, that, into that gasoline mix could uh, raise the octane. So uh, this was a grand idea, but what happened when they started putting uh, the aromatic loaded fuel into the B-26, the toluene and benzene ate away the seals on the diaphragm in the carburetor. Now, when, it, when is your carburetor going to quit? While you're sitting at the end of the runway idling? or when you're at max power, just lifting off the ground. It's going to happen when you're at max power lifting off the ground. Your carburetor is going to quit. You're going to lose an engine. The second thing that happened is this was an a electrical intensive airplane. So uh, the crew chief on each B-26 would go out early in the morning, and he had to check everything out make sure it worked. So he'd get in, turn down all the instrument lights, uh, turn on every, radios, everything. Got to make sure it works. Does it light up? Does it light up? Okay. Uh, then, of course, they had that. I said they had an electric uh, turret in the back. So go back there and let's spin that turret around seven or eight times. Make sure it's working just fine. So <laughs> what happened uh, many times when the B-26 instructor and his students 
went out to take off, their engines had not been running long enough to recharge the battery, which the maintenance guy ran down doing the pre-flight check. So guess what? They're taking off, just breaking ground, and electrical power goes out. Wait a minute now, this airplane has electric props. Some of them made it back, some of them didn't. <clears throat> the electric prop also had a unique mechanical uh, arrangement. The prop spinning at you know 2,000 RPM, and the electric motor actuator is out there at 2,000 RPM. So how do you send a signal from uh, the uh, the throttle to increase prop pitch? Well, uh, you have to have a spinning contact plate and brushes held against the plate with springs, right? And then you send the electrical impulse out and it gets to the electrical uh, motor and it changes prop pitch. Well, uh, these maintainers didn't know anything about maintaining that. They never cleaned them. They got dirty, full of dust. And guess what happened? Just when you're taking off, you got no control over your prop. The other thing to remember, basically, uh, this was the Dash 5 R2800 engine, and it was not as reliable as the wonderful 2800s that powered the P47 and uh, the Corsair and the Hellcat later in the war. So it had its own inherent uh, reliability problems. So uh, <clears throat> high number of accidents. It was getting such a bad reputation that the ferry pilots, civilian pilots hired to ferry the B-26 from the factory down to Tampa, Florida, they all quit. So we're not flying that airplane, it's too dangerous. Pilots who were in pilot training uh, would march into the commander's office and take off the wings and say, send me to the infantry, I'm not flying anymore. And then uh, the Tampa uh, Bay, excuse me, the uh, Tampa, Florida newspaper uh, coined a new phrase, and, uh, and they repeated it often. And the headline was, one a day in Tampa Bay. Actually, only 13 B-26s ended up in Tampa Bay over 19 months, but it was a catchy thing to put on the headline. <clears throat> About this time, uh, not to be outdone, a little gallows humor, uh, the boys who were doing uh, Marauder training uh, made a song, and it actually got some play on local radios. I'm not going to sing it, but here's the lyrics. When learning to fly the marauder, he heard many wonderful things, but all he could see were the engines. Oh, where the hell are the wings? Why did I join the Air Corps? For mother, dear mother, knew best. Here I lie beneath the wreckage, marauder all over my chest. So. Obviously, uh, we got a problem there. Really, you've heard it before. I played it. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on here. I don't want to take too much more time with this uh, thing on minimum control speed. Uh, is it is it pretty? Is my explanation strong enough? Do you understand? If you're going too slow. Uh, you're not going to get enough air across that rudder, which means you will not be able to counteract the excessive thrust from the good engine if you lost one. You've got to be going at least 170 miles an hour uh, in the B-26. Now, if you're not going 170 miles an hour, all you can do uh, to stay in the air is pull back the power on the good engine, which means you're crashing straight ahead. The other alternative, if you don't do that, and if you keep the power up when you have one engine out on a twin engine, twin engine airplane, any twin engine airplane, that in this case, that right wing will eventually rise, the airplane will go inverted, and you will hit the ground cockpit first. So not a good position to be in. Now, why, why, uh, why did we end up in this problem? Well, first of all, remember, <laughs> 170 miles an hour, it takes a long time to get a World War II bomber that takes off, breaks ground at maybe 110, to get up to 170 where he's going to be perfectly safe. So uh, two things were going on. The Air Corps, part of the Army, said, you know, when you get overseas, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, you're not going to get, you're only going to get a 5,000-foot runway at best. 
So you better learn to take off whatever you're flying within 5,000 feet. So what they uh, taught the B-26 uh, people to do uh, as a takeoff procedure, they said, before you start rolling, take the uh, yoke and put it all the way back in your chest and hold it there. And then release the brakes. And if you do that, uh, at 60 miles an hour, the nose is going to lift off. At 120, the airplane will lift off. And then uh, after you get airborne, if there are no obstacles out there in front of you, uh, make sure you get the gear up immediately. It's a big drag. Get your flaps up and go hunting for 170, and then you're safe. But what happened is that if you're anywhere in this regime right here, but less than 170, uh, and right after takeoff, that's the danger zone. And it was always there. It never went away. So that's uh, what they faced. So the only thing they could think about, they could possibly do uh, to prevent this is they had to uh, create more reliable power plants, better maintenance to cut down on the probability that you would lose an engine under 170 knots. The other thing uh, <clears throat> that's, that goes on currently is uh, many times the uh, twin engine aircraft. Anybody ever taken uh, a flight where you're on this big comfortable airplane and then you, then you got to go to from Philadelphia to Richmond, and you go out and you get on what that twin engine turboprop, right? And you know it's about that wide. And uh, I'll tell you what: before you take off in that airplane, you go up to the cockpit. The first thing you need to do is ask the pilot what's your minimum control speed. And if he hesitates, you might as well get off. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's the minimum control speed story. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention is uh, another solution to uh, not achieving minimum control speed. Uh, if you had a longer runway, why don't you just stay on the ground uh, until you reach 170 miles an hour and then take off? Well, that's what modern airliners do. But in 1939, we did not have the tire technology to uh, spin up uh, the wheels on a B-25 or a B-26 to 170 miles an hour. They just they'd fall apart. Another reason why they took off prematurely and put themselves in this danger zone. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the Truman Committee. Uh, there was a kind of a no name, nobody knew him, uh, senator from Missouri, Harry Truman. Now, Harry Truman had been an artillery officer in uh, World War I. And Harry was on the receiving end of some pretty crappy supplies that were provided by manufacturers in the United States and sent over to Europe uh, to support the troops in World War I. And he was very concerned that uh, people involved in World War, World War II would not have the same experience he had. <clears throat> Things didn't, got arrived, they were shabbily made, didn't work, fell apart. So he petitioned uh, President Roosevelt uh, got his support, and they pushed through Congress the creation of a committee to investigate fraud, waste, and war profiteering. War profiteering, charging the government too much money for the things they're, they're given to the GIs. So, uh, and he was the head of that commission, the committee rather. So in July 1942, in reaction to all these B-26 crashes, Harry Truman uh, drags uh, Hap Arnold, the chief of the uh, Air Corps, and uh, 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 Peyton Magruder, the engineer, brought him in and said, you've got to solve this problem. We're killing our boys in Tampa Bay. W what are you going to do about it? And uh, Hap Arnold, the chief of the Air Corps, said, I know it looks bad right now, but trust me, things are getting better. It's going to get better. And oh, by the way, we have this report. The Japanese say they can't catch the uh, the B-26, but they can the B-25, and it's doing real well out there in the Pacific. So just give us a few months and things will improve. Well, guess what? They didn't improve. October 1942, Harry Truman drags them back for Senate hearings on the B-26, and they ground the airplanes. So what's Hap Arnold, the chief of the Air Corps, going to do? Uh, holy cow, we've got to solve this problem. Who am I going to send down there to solve this problem? Well, how about Colonel Doolittle, who several months ago led the B-25 raid on Tokyo. Now, to explain Jimmy Doolittle's status in American society after he successfully bombed Tokyo, if Colin Powell 
and Taylor Swift had a baby, it would be Jimmy Doolittle. <laughs> this guy was uh, popular beyond belief. Everyone, he had the confidence of the Congress, the President, everybody. This guy walked on water. So uh, Hap Arnold sent Doolittle down to Tampa Bay to uh, figure out what was going on. The first thing he did, he went to the factory in Baltimore, got some tips on how to fly the B-26, and Doolittle shows up at Tampa Bay, and they assemble all the instructors and students out there on the flight line, and here comes Doolittle flying on what? One engine. And he proceeds to do shondells and steep turns on one engine, and people were astounded that it could fly on one engine after all the problems they'd had. <clears throat> so once he got on the ground, he brought in a new team. Uh, the solution was pretty simple. Uh, he's, he started a new pilot training syllabus, uh, giving them more time to adjust to the B-26. Uh, flight instructors were standardized. They got uh, checks every month to make sure they were following the prescribed methods for landing and takeoff. Uh, they improved, they set up schools and set up and uh, improved maintenance training. And then uh, back in Washington, D.C., uh, Peyton uh, Magruder uh, admitted to Harry Truman that, you know, we made the wings too short, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, we're going to change the production line of B-26s. We're going to add three feet to every wing, and you need that rudder control for minimum control speed. They made the rudder two feet higher. Now, after all that, those shenanigans, uh, they reduced the minimum control speed from 170 down to about 160. It's still a problem, but they learned to cope with it. So uh, after all these changes, by the fall of 1943, the B-26 uh, training group had logged 10,000 flight hours without a single accident. And from there on, uh, things operated pretty normally. So to put this in perspective, I mean, it sounds terrible, but here's what's going on in the background. This is World War II. There's some relevant statistics. Well, first of all, did you know that, can you imagine that one out of every three people in an army uniform in World War II was in the Air Corps? In the Air Corps, not on the ground. P-38 was a twin engine airplane, and the B-26 was experiencing 165 crashes per 100,000 flying hours. <clears throat> the P-38 was right behind it with 105, but we weren't complaining about that too much. The, uh, the uh, U.S. airmen killed in World War II, I don't mean to make light of those who died flying the B-26, but total uh, losses in combat, 52,000, 52,000. I think what we lose in the European theater in total, about 125,000. So there's almost half of our casualties in World War II in Europe were in the Air Corps. Now, this is uh, even more interesting. You think about this training problem we had in the B-26. Here we are with uh, US airmen killed in training, <coughs> training accidents in the United States. They never got overseas. We killed 13,000 pilots. If you count uh, the additional training that went on at overseas bases, the total number is almost 26,000 uh, uh, pilots and air crew killed in training. So those are big numbers. Now, in, in terms of uh, casualties, 54% <clears throat> of B-17 and B-24 uh, crews, 54% were either killed or shot down and captured. Uh, and uh, finally, <clears throat> U.S. infantry killed in action World War II throughout. The, I mean, there were some terrible events, you know, the invasion of Normandy and all that. But <clears throat> generally, the average over those years in World War II uh, killed in action 15.5% if you're in the infantry. 62% were wounded. So this puts us in, in perspective on how dangerous uh, and how heroic these young airmen were, probably because they didn't really understand what the risks they were facing. So. So what did the B-26 do in combat once it got there? Well, it turned out that uh, they were taking, they were trying to bomb at low level. Keep in mind, the B-26 and the B-25 have got the same Norden bomb site as the B-17. But the B-17 is dropping from 25,000 feet, which made precision bombing a little sketchy. <clears throat> B-26 has found out they could operate safely at uh, 10,000 feet. And at 10,000 feet with a Norden bomb site, 
these guys were deadly accurate. They also adopted new tactics. They found out when they're flying at 10,000 feet, it took 17 seconds for the German anti-aircraft crew to uh, plot your path and al altitude. And then they sent that to the gun crew. It took another 11 seconds to adjust the gun and fire around. So what, they, what the B-26 people learned at 10,000 feet is if we uh, turn 10 degrees left or right about every 20 to 25 seconds, we're going to avoid a lot of that flak. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So that's the uh, technique they used. They flew at 10,000 feet, they did some jinking around, and they, they survived a lot of flak damage. Uh, it was also, as I mentioned before, with that corrugated metal in the wings, this was a very rugged airplane. Remember, we've got tension in the wings because they welded these panels on when they were hot. <clears throat> so uh, the really uh, ironic thing about this whole story is, after all this mess they went through in training, the B-26 had the lowest loss rate of any U.S. bomber in World War II. One half of one percent permission. One half of one percent loss rate. Now, there's a, a number of reasons for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, I'm giving them too much credit because what happened was, <clears throat> as uh, the invasion of Europe uh, began, the B-26s moved from uh, the UK over to France and began their bombing campaigns. Uh, at this point, the B-17s were going after the heartland. And most of the German fighters had moved back from uh, eastern France back to protect the homeland to fight against the B-24s and the B-17s. So <clears throat> the B-26s did encounter uh, German fighters, but not in the same, uh, at the same intensity as the B-17s had to cope with. <clears throat> Similarly, if uh, the P-47 uh, group is right over here down the street in France, and here's the B-26 base, Hey guys, we're going to uh, Belgium tomorrow. Would you like to tag along? So it was easier to arrange fighter escort uh, for the B-26s. So that was a, uh, a factor as well. But even at that, uh, one half of one percent is very respectable. Now I want to go on and just uh, briefly talk about a couple other things here. The destruction of the uh, uh, V-1 sites and uh, right after the invasion uh, of Normandy, the V-1s were really we peppering England, and uh, as a psychological weapon, they were devastating. So there was a, uh, they put a, a, a British air marshal in charge of the campaign to defeat the V-1s, to find them and bomb the sites before they could uh, launch any more. So his primary tool was the American B-26. His records show, photographic evidence, the, the B-26 is dedicated to the anti-V-1 program, knocked out 400 missile sites, 400. And uh, this Air Marshal Sir John Slesser uh, uh, testified th about the astonishing accuracy of the uh, B-26. He said it was the finest bomber in World War II. So, now there's something else on here I want to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the D-Day uh, mission of the B-26. <clears throat> Here's the Normandy beaches. There's uh, Omaha Beach. Here's Utah Beach, the two uh, U.S. Uh, beaches to be assaulted. And uh, so in preparation for the landing, the B-17s were assigned Omaha Beach. The B-26s were assigned Utah Beach. On the morning of the invasion, there was solid cloud cover. The B-17s took off from England. They uh, passed over the island of Wight uh, and several other references. And they, because they couldn't see the ground, cloud cover, they dropped on timing. In other words, we're going, you know, we got the bomb bay open. We're doing a 245. That means in exactly one minute and 36 seconds uh, from this point, we should be over the beach. The beach would be under the clouds. We're going to drop our bombs. Well, <clears throat> now... <laughs> This is rather imprecise. So if you're a B-17 crew, one of the things you don't want to do, you don't want to drop short because you'll hit the ships out there that are invading Normandy, right? 
So they added a few seconds for mom and the kids. And all the B-17 uh, bombs, almost all of them, fell inland. They missed their target. By contrast, the B-26s went in under the clouds. And there was a Smithsonian study done after World War II. And they went out and surveyed the situation and looked at uh, photo reconnaissance. And they determined that B-26s hit 100% of their targets at Utah Beach. 100%. So this, here's what happened. Omaha Beach, 34,000 GIs landed there. 2,500 died on the beach. B-17 support. The B-26 went to Utah Beach. They landed 23,000 uh, GIs at Utah. 197 dead. The 4th Infantry Division lost more people, killed more people training for the invasion than they lost at Utah Beach. Now, the B-26 was so effective on this mission that it really uh, caused some embarrassment to the Air Corps because guess what? They've spent millions of dollars building this dandy B-17. It's going to solve all our problems. It's going to end the war. And uh, they were very reluctant. As a matter of fact, they squashed the whole story. And uh, it was never, it was not in Hap Arnold's uh, diary that he published after the war. There was no mention of it. But clearly the B-26 uh, did its job. Now, there we go. <clears throat> uh, let's go back to the, uh, uh, I want to talk about aircraft and notes, certain B-26s that are, uh, became famous. The Battle of Midway, back on 4 June, back when the B-26s were uh, in the Pacific in a small group in Australia, they sent four B-26s to Midway. And uh, all the B-26s at that time, as you can see in the picture, every B-26 early on came off the production line with uh, shackles for torpedoes. They were, they were determined to make a torpedo bomber out of this thing. So... Uh, <clears throat> Went to Midway, loaded up with torpedoes, and these four B-26s took off all by themselves, no fighter cover, and they went out to attack the Japanese fleet at Midway. Two of the B-26s were shot down immediately. Uh, uh, two others uh, somehow made it back to Midway. But uh, Lieutenant Murray, in uh, tail number 401391, with the, uh, the, the uh, paint scheme here, Susie Q, that was his girlfriend's name, uh, dropped his torpedo, but it was one of those Mark 13 early torpedoes, and the detonators didn't work, so it went bang against the uh, aircraft carrier, the Yagaki, uh, and then it, he peeled away. Now he's got uh, zeros riddling him from above. He's got every anti-aircraft gun in the entire Japanese fleet shooting at him, and so he says, what the hell? And he, he turns back, he lines up with the uh, deck of the Japanese aircraft carrier, and he deliberately flies the B-26 down the deck of the carrier below the level of the con their uh, control box here, and gets and it uses that uh, intermission to gain some speed. Because when he went down here, guess what? These guys aren't going to shoot at him because they might hit the carrier. Similarly, the anti-aircraft guns over here aren't going to shoot at him because they might hit the carrier. And he escaped, went back to Midway, and landed. Two of his crew members were killed. And when he landed, they counted 500 20 millimeter holes and, and lighter caliber holes in the airplane. It was completely riddled. And I made it back to Midway. It was such a disaster that they uh, scavenged a few spare parts and they pushed the B-26 into the Pacific. So <clears throat> this uh, very famous uh, World War II aviation artist, Roy Grinnell, was inspired by the story. And he painted uh, this, which is, uh, I believe is in the Air Force Museum now in Dayton, Ohio. Susie Q. Another uh, famous uh, B-26, tail number 4131773. This airplane flew more missions in Europe than any other bomber aircraft. Showed up in early 43, was still flying in 45, and uh, it's... Uh, paint scheme here says flak bait and you can see all the bomb mission uh, symbols on here and this was taken when it had completed its 200th mission it actually flew 207 uh, at the end of the war all the B-26s in Europe were gathered up 
uh, taken to a remote site in Germany and cut to pieces, trashed them all. Uh, but flak bait was rescued. Uh, it, somebody paid for its, trans, uh, its transport back to the States and ended up, and flak bait today is in the, uh, the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. It started out as just the uh, front uh, fuselage. Uh, they have all the other pieces, and they're now building it up to be a, in its original uh, condition. Now, as a, a tribute to flak bait, <clears throat> if you went to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana today, you'd find a B-52 out there on the flight line, and look what they did. They named their B-52 flak bait in honor of the original flak bait. So, Now, it's kind of an epilogue uh, to this presentation. This is Carolyn. This was one of the B-26s still flying in the United States, didn't go overseas. Uh, some uh, corporate magnets bought this. It was owned by various corporations and companies over the year. They used it for advertising. Uh, it finally ended up at the Commemorative Air Force, it used to be called a Confederate Air Force. Uh, they were operating it, operating it uh, out of Midland, Texas. Uh, they had a qualified pilot. Uh, to exercise the airplane. Uh, the pilot had uh, uh, 8,000 hours as a, a jet aircraft pilot. And uh, so he went down to Midland uh, to fire this baby up and uh, take it out for a spin and do some, some stall recovery uh, exercises and things of that nature, get familiar with the airplane. He hadn't flown it for a year. So uh, <laughs> What happened is uh, he was coming back to land at Midland in 1995, August of 1995, and uh, witnesses said uh, they saw him coming in for approach. He was about 250 feet, and they could hear one of the engines sputtering. And uh, then the airplane, guess what? One wing rose, and it rolled over on its back and crashed. That was the last flying B-26. Is there one in Florida? Oh, excellent. I, I stand corrected. Oh, I, I, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. All right. So uh, so here, here we are. This is the uh, end of the presentation. So now you've got to ask yourself, after all we've talked about here, uh, did the B-26 get a bad rap? Uh, was it pushing technology uh, too far too soon? Did they not prepare uh, our basic pilot trainees to deal with the unique wing and uh, flight characteristics of the B-26? Or was it just too damn risky and shouldn't it have been canceled in the first place? Uh, well, I, I hope I've educated you a little bit about the B-26, so you can form your own opinions about that and perhaps do some more reading. Uh, but uh, in, the world, in the words of Jimmy Doolittle, it was an excellent airplane.